All right, let's just take it away. Let's go for it. All right, so hello, everyone. Um, I'm Aaron, this is Ben. And we've prepared a panel for everyone with uh, advice on field and Foley recording. Um, we're going to cover quite a few different levels. So there's going to be stuff for everyone, hopefully. And we're going to go from basics into kind of like how to use your recordings for some awesome sound design. And then right at the end, we will answer anyone's questions. All right, so importantly, <laughs> who are we? Uh, I'm Aaron Amo Travis. I am currently a sound designer at Larian on Baldur's Gate 3. And I also work at the studio Jumpship. Uh, I've worked on the title Somerville, Bangle Balls, Life of Delta, Skywind with Ben, and I did some traders for Cyberpunk 2077. Look at him. And I'm Ben. Um, I'm a freelance sound designer and field and foley recording artist or enthusiast. And I'm currently working on Combustion for 3D Realms and on Call of Seragna from I in the Keep Games. And on the side, I've also got a podcast about this topic. So I'm the host of the Field and Foley podcast. So feel free to check it out if you need some more, more Field and Foley material. Yeah, and we'll quickly just start with a, a very brief, very brief overview of what field recording and Foley is, in case anyone has not heard of the terms yet. So field recording is, in general, uh, capturing sound outside of a studio environment that can't be replicated in a studio, like a bird song or a river or a waterfall. That's very hard to do in your studio. <laughs> and um, yeah, but it's not only um, just going out with normal microphones, you can also use something that you can see here, like an electromagnetic microphone or contact microphones on the water, whatever. But oftentimes it just means you're sitting around in a field, um, enjoying nature and recording what nature has to offer. And um, yeah, what is Foley recording, you might ask? Um, Foley is capturing specific everyday sounds like footsteps, clothes, and movement, but not sound effects like gunshots, vehicles, etc. And that was traditionally done for live radio broadcasts in the 1920s. So there was a guy sitting there or a girl just making the sounds while the radio drama was playing. And later on, it got into the movie business big. And that's that's something that people can normally recognize these um, Foley artists doing sounds from material that's already finished uh, in a studio. And it oftentimes looks like this. You have this big Foley stage and that's the expectation, right? You have a big stage with sand and grass and gravel and everything and lots of things to play with. But I can tell you in reality, it looks more like, uh, yeah, making a mess in your studio because you stabbed a melon and then you have to clean up. But it's fun nonetheless. Um, and Foley really is, in the last, I would say in the last years, especially for me, gained like a broader, um, a broader part of the of the work. It's not just like making footsteps for for movies, but it's making some sounds for whatever medium you do. Um, especially in games, in the last years, it has has taken a big step forward. Um, the most um, recent prominent example is like the God of War Ragnarok series, where they had a, a whole bunch of Foley artists in a dedicated Foley team just for all the cloth movements, the footsteps and everything around that. Yeah, and you might have asked yourself then, okay, how do I start recording stuff? And the good, good message here is that the best gear is the one you have in your hand right now. So you can start today, just go out like with your phone or get a recorder, um, whatever you prefer. But um, to be honest, it's it's all about starting and use what you have and then just see how far you get because in the end listening is way more important than recording it's about getting a feel for how places sound how materials sound and just trying to experiment with yeah with the gear you have so um there are many examples where people have told me that recordings from a phone have landed in triple a games so <laughs> it's it's totally feasible to choose to use whatever you have right now. All right, so uh, following on from Ben's advice, I'm gonna give you some advice that um, I feel like one of the main uh, differences between uh, field and Foley is that in the field, um, 
you're in an uncontrolled environment. So being flexible is extremely important. Um, I feel like usually what will happen is you, like good advice would be to prepare, to plan what you need, and then to just be patient because things will go wrong. So a bit of a story time. Um, on one of my last field recording trips, I, um, I basically planned the whole trip. Uh, it was gonna be several days on a remote location, um, packed all my microphones into my car, my recorders, all this stuff, drove many hours away from my house to go on this trip. And um, when I got there, it was a nightmare. It was one of the the worst, uh, had some of the worst wind I've ever encountered on a in a recording session. And it just completely derailed everything I was supposed to be doing there. So I was stuck with uh, trying to record impact sounds and these very um, small detailed sounds with in a location that was just extremely, extremely noisy. Um, so, you know, things could have gone several ways. I could have just got really frustrated or I could have been flexible and capitalized on this moment. So that's what I ended up doing. Felt that uh, it would have been a good, a good time to capture a ton of wind. And with all my mics, um, I started placing them in just random places around this house and looking for interesting ways of recording wind. We got a ton of different ambiences and a ton of trees getting blown in different directions that we could later use for processing and you know something that could have been a complete disaster um thanks to this flexible angle just turned into a really nice pattern of sounds yeah and also the good takeaway here is even if you record something that sounds shit um please remember this sentence always there is no shitty recording and I mean that in the truest sense. I've used uh, recordings from sessions where I felt this was the absolute worst. I can't use this for anything, but I found a use for it. And sometimes it's maybe just you process it until you can't even hear it anymore, but you have this nice unique sound that no one else has. But there's also something um, that comes with just trying to save everything, even if it's shitty and using it later when you need it. Um, a good example of that is, um, let's just say you you decide to record a, on a nice band. Um, you have this festival going on or whatever, and you pack all your stuff and you're really excited. And then the band is absolute dog shit. Like really almost hurts your ears. They sound wrong. The singing is awful. It's mixed, totally overblown bass, whatever. And you could be frustrated and just pack it up, but you could also just record that and keep this for later. And you should, because um, if you think about it, let's just say at one point, you have to have a shitty band recording in your game or movie or whatever. Um, trying to find some on the spot is, in my opinion, pretty much impossible. And also, um, I personally wouldn't want to approach a band saying, hey, you play like shit, can I record you? I need exactly that. And please ruin the mix while you're at it. So, um, yeah, remember this. Whatever it is, even if it's a shitty phone recording, sometimes you maybe need that, that, that sound or this specific thing, or this gives you this texture you need. So yeah, pack your terabytes of data, store them away, no shitty recording ever. And um, one of the things I always like to say is, I love the sound of napalm in the morning, <laughs> which means is I, I pretty much love to go out and if I'm at a location, think about different times of day and seasons for the same space because you might go to a place and it's very windy or it's very trafficy or something but there will be at least a time of day or a season where everything sounds different so don't just like go to a place once um, really think about visiting it on, on several days times and also of course seasons to catch all the different sounds you hear there because the birds will be um, will sound different and the people will sound different and the traffic will sound different and the wind will sound different and you can get so many things about the same space. So um, one of the key advices here is to really like take your time and practice prolonged listening, just sitting at a place and letting it sink in on, on different occasions because deep listening can really uncover some sonic gold. All right, so um some of my advice for kind of like what sounds you should be you could you could start recording so 
Um, traditionally, like most libraries tend to be either like a generous library or most more like a specific thing. So that could be like a big collection of uh, water textures or like fire, something like that, rustling trees with wind. Um, when it comes to game audio, um, there's so many variations you need to account for. Where imagine the situation you've been, you're working on a monster that's made out of fire. And that monster might have an attack sound, a death sound, a special sound, a hurt sound, like all these different things. It might have an intro, like, it, you know, it bursts into flames. Um, what, like, one of the main advantages of recording your own material is you're going to be able to build these palettes of sounds that cover a range of um, things that are going to later on help you build these, these um, assets. You're going to have, uh, like, what often tends to happen is you'll be scrolling through a library and you'll find this really awesome gooey texture or something and it's like wow that, that would work really well in my design but you have this single recording and you need to pump out 100 assets so um thinking in this way you're building palettes you're almost building um construction kits if anyone is familiar with some of the bigger libraries like boom that's how they tend to separate their things they, they tend to have like a designed um sound set and more of a construction kit that's kind of how I like to think about things now. I'm, I'm looking for all of these sounds that will help me uh, just build stuff later on. Yeah, and if you go out um, and decide on some kind of place, um, there's, at least in my mind, always the option to consider, do I want to like craft something or do I want to get like the real thing? Um, big things is like, for example, in whatever car games you have where they use like the real cars, the real model and record exactly that because they want this kind of uh, realism. But it's not just that, it's also, um, for example, I recorded in an abandoned mineshaft and I could have just like made some water droplets and made some reverb on there, but I decided to get the real ambience of, of a place underground. The good thing is you don't have planes or birds because it's in the middle of the mountain. So very clean recording. Can recommend going into a mineshaft uh, if you have people with you because yeah, can also be dangerous. But um, what ended up happening and what, what really surprised me and, and, and made me feel like this was the, the right decision that after we put this into game and we had um, a short demo and a video out, I got this one comment from a player that he said, Going into the cave reminded him of his teen, uh, his teens time, where he, yeah, where he got spelunking into the different caves in his neighborhood, and it sounded exactly like that. And he felt like a callback to the times where he went exploring there, and he was really impressed with the sound. And that made me realize that something, something so real sometimes is exactly the th uh, the right thing to do. Um, but this this is not just true for like. I would say more exotic locations for like for a mineshaft, but also if you think about your city, how your city and your location sounds or your town, um, every location is unique and every location has its charm because the traffic in your city doesn't sound like the traffic in New York or in Paris and the, the cityscape doesn't sound the same, the people, the wallah doesn't sound the same. Uh, even like, for example, beeps from um, from those traffic lights for um, for seeing impaired people sound different in different countries uh, sounds of buses for example every location is very unique even if it's a noisy location so maybe think about if you want to bring your own city in a game or bring your own location in there you could also like use the generic traffic sounds from some kind of library but sometimes yeah there's nothing like the real thing and maybe you evoke something in a player because he realizes the country or he realizes some sounds and that's this could be a really good really good game but of course realism is not always real i think as we all know um bones breaking is uh, frozen celery of course <laughs> um and so if you're really crafting a sound or if you want to do something to get an emotion across um it's good to step back from the realism um one example i have for me is that i really wanted to get a sword and now I have a sword on the wall but the first time I like played around with it and made the gesture of pulling the sword out 
I was very disappointed because it sounded like nothing. <laughs> and clanging little things, it sounded very dull and very yeah, real. But we are used to like these shing sounds from movies, especially for the old school movies. So we have this kind of hearing. So sometimes you need this fake real sound, but sometimes you can even invent something else, something of your own. And uh, a tip that I like to give you is to use your imagination and maybe even close your eyes while listening to the recordings and concentrate just on the sound to get something that you want to evoke and not something that you want to go, uh, want to go. Yeah, that's, that's how it sounds in real life. Um, of course, depends on, on the case, but <laughs> yeah, Greg just said in the chat, spatulas are also great. Yes, they are, but I also want to get a real Foley sword. Um, I will have that soon, hopefully. All right, so this next point is some advice that, uh, it's an evolution of some advice I got from my audio director at Jumpship, Matteo. And it's this idea that sound is storytelling. So any, like when, when you're sound designing, any chance you have to put rhythm or to tell unique sonic story like moments within that design is something you should probably be capitalizing on. So if you think of maybe like a, a big metal scaffolding falling down, you don't really want to just cover that with the the literal sounds of, of metal hitting the ground. You, you want to look for these opportunities where you could have textures of cable snapping, you could have tension, you could have layers that build up into that release and then the eventual crash. So ever since thinking in those terms, um, the kind of sounds that I'm looking for when I go out recording, it's it's not usually ambiences, realistic things like, like Ben is going for. I'm the kind of guy that usually looks for these textures that are later on going to be used in these kind of storytelling ways. So I, I like grabbing items and, and using them in unusual ways. I'm looking for those kind of tense build and release type motions, um, anything that could crescendo. Um, and then once you're designing, yeah, just any moment is good for you to try and build your sounds with these. Yeah, and something I also um, really like to do, as Aaron already said, we have different approaches to things and different like styles of, of, of recording and, and using your stuff, um, is the fact that different mics are different things. And I, I'm talking about very different mics. For example, you can see here, this is a copper phone that sounds like a 50s radio show. You have contact mics, you have underwater mics, and you can really use your, so to say, supersonic abilities by combining different uh, microphones. One, one example that's probably really easy to, to grasp is what I like to do if I do something in a pond or in, in a body of water, um, I'd like to put an underwater mic into it. I point a, like a shotgun mic, for example, at the surface, and I also have a stereo rig there. And then when I throw something in, I have like the ambient surrounding it, the hit with the shotgun mic, and also with the underwater mic and everything underwater with the underwater mic. So we have the whole thing in one motion and everything lined up and then you can play around with it. You can even do stuff like blending from stereo to mono and down to the underwater mic um, for a really nice effect. And I really like to use those kind of effects instead of editing. I also like to do that in, in certain points, but um, I, I absolutely love doing that like out in the field trying to think about what I want to do. And I mean, if it doesn't work, the good thing is you have three nice sources to just use for the end. So that's, yeah, something that I can really recommend. Bring different mics and record with um, as much different stuff as you have to have some options and maybe even think about beforehand what you want to, what you want to do with that. Um, but of course, also just experiment because um, yeah, even for me, I have some of the mics I have like for six years now, but I'm still um, finding new ways of using them. And sometimes a recording totally goes to shit. But as we already said, there's no shitty recording, so it doesn't really matter. All right, so this is more of a sound design um, approach, but this is kind of how you'd be using your your field recordings or 40 recordings. Um, what tends to happen a lot is you'll be designing something and all of a sudden you're a couple of hours into the design and you've, you have about 50 layers. 
and just something about it doesn't really sit right. Um, I mean, this kind of stuff happens <laughs> more often than, than not. And like you just start deleting layers, deleting layers, and eventually you, you kind of boil it down to these three or four layers that are really carrying the sound. They're, they're responsible for this storytelling element from my previous point. Um, so I'd, I'd like you to think in those kind of in, in that kind of way. When, when you're building things, really look for those unique sources that will be able to carry everything. So like try and try and make it work with three or four sounds. Obviously, build into that if you have to. So make things hit harder, make things crescendo harder. But essentially, boil it down to to make it work with less. And that uh, is leading us into our next point, um, where I just want to cover more or less my like the stuff I'm doing with all of my source recordings now. It's like my car the current stage in my career, and. Um, what I'm usually doing is I'm grabbing one of these source recordings that might have been, say, like a cloth flap that I recorded ages ago. And I'm throwing all these recordings into really elaborate effects chains to try and create something completely different. In this case, it might be a fireball. Um, so when you're doing that, you're, you're usually stacking a lot of effects. So you might be stacking compressors, saturators. You might be throwing some distortion in it. like you might be doing some really crazy stuff to these original uh, source material. So something I've been doing recently that has been helping to save time later on down the line is that while I'm cleaning up my recordings, uh, usually in RX, um, I have everything going through a second um, through a second track that already has some kind of big crazy effects chain going. Um, so then I can kind of hear how they're going to play once I'm blowing them up. And what usually tends to happen is you'll think a recording is clean, but once you throw it through an effects chain, all of a sudden you hear your neighbor's kids screaming, you, you hear a dog somewhere, an airplane, all of these things that might not have caught your eye until you boosted it by 24 dB and you have all this crazy stuff going on. So um, yeah, just a little, little piece of advice that might help you some time down the line. That's also something I need to try. <laughs> And this is going to be our final point. And it's this notion that a sound designer is always sound designing, and a recordist is, should always be recording. Um, if you feel like you've liked the stuff we've talked about in this panel, and you want to dive deeper into all of this, um, I encourage you to just go out every day and record stuff. And have, as we've pointed out, like you already have the best gear you need. and Experience is just going to make you better at things. Like the more you listen to things through microphones, the better you're going to get. The more you experiment with different types of microphones, the more you're going to get to know them. Um, and then once you're out in the field, just be patient and opportunities will present themselves. The things that you didn't know were going to be there on that trip will all of a sudden be there. And you'll probably end up with some very nice recordings. Um, something you could do if, um, if you're starting out maybe, or, I mean, any stage of your career really, is um, it's usually quite hard to get recordings on your own, if you, especially if you have to maybe like throw around some rocks, drag some stuff around, you might have different tripods and stuff. So um, you could um, team up with other sound designers, so other field recorders, maybe post if anyone in your area wants to go out and record rock impacts, you know, like both of you team up, you probably have different microphones, um, you can help each other out and then just share the results. And an even a better step would be uh, I encourage everyone to sign up to the field recording Slack um, and joining maybe some of their crowdsources. Um, ever since I've done that, it's been one of the best things I've probably done <laughs> as a sound designer. Uh, I've participated in maybe eight or nine crowdsources, and I'm still using those. I use them in every single project. They're always useful. So, um, And it will encourage you to go out and record, have some kind of um, structure to follow, and you'll probably have a lot of fun and learn a lot. Absolutely. So for the people joining late or who don't want to talk, uh, listen to us talk for half an hour almost, um, we have a too long, didn't listen to reiterate some of the key points, but we will also share the slides after the talk. So um, yeah, the first point is you already have all you need. So get recording, get out there maybe tonight 
tomorrow whenever you have time. Just try it. Um, get your own unique sounds in there because whatever you record is one of a kind always. And be prepared to listen for longer and at different times and seasons than you think. Um, I've known people that are into very prolonged listening and sit around for four or five hours. Um, I usually <laughs> don't do more than two, but I've I've tried to like expand that. And every time I do, I'm glad I did it because there's something that just happens, I don't know, once a day maybe. And sometimes I catch those things and it's it's always a really, really nice experience when that happens. And yeah, then build your sound palettes. Um, just like we mentioned, like get a lot of textures, a lot of recordings of the same thing. Um, you'll have a lot of material to work with and then use them for sonic t uh, storytelling and use them for your unique approach to things. And yeah, point everything at the sound. Um, but at the end, if you have 20 tracks, those are too much. So choose the ones you want and make it work with selected elements, maybe blend between those. Um, yeah. And uh, of course, if everything goes wrong, no recordings useless, even and even shitty band recordings, uh, especially shitty band recordings. So if you have some, keep them, keep them, please. Um, and as you might have like noticed, we are we have different approaches to do things. So if you do something different, there's no one way to feed record. There's nothing you can't do anything wrong. Um, there are people out there like <laughs> Greg that doesn't record with headphones. <sighs> Yes, uh, people record with or without headphones, with or without recorders or with mics, with built-in mics or upside down. Whatever you do, um, find your style, experiment and expect everything to go wrong. And yeah, just roll with it. So thank you for listening. And uh, now it's time for the Q&A and we've burned through our material. So we have a lot of time left. So We'll just look through the chat for questions or play, maybe just put them in there. Um, maybe, Aaron, do you want to like answer the question we already had earlier in the... Yeah, absolutely. Right? I can mm -hmm. take it away. Yeah, just like reiterate the question again and then, yeah. Yeah, so we have a question from Enrique, um, who is saying, who is asking, is there a cheaper approach to cleaning up my recordings than having to buy and learn RX9 and such? Any tips on organization as well? Um, so something like Isotope RX is absolutely magical. So I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> it, it is probably the thing I use every day out of all the plugins I own. But you absolutely do not need this. You don't need it to start out. Um, there's a ton of things you can do for free. I think um, Nick Von Kano, I think his name is, he posted a list of uh, plugins with free alternatives um that you could check out and it's pretty good so you might find something useful there i've used um a plugin by waves called wns which regularly goes on on offer for maybe like 29 dollars um and it's fantastic i actually use that on my bus after rx but you could start with something like that it's a cedar replica so um you could definitely get away with using something like that. And like the, the notion is you, you don't really need to spend stuff to, to, to get into a game audio. I mean, you might think so. You might start seeing videos where everyone is doing stuff with crazy plugins. And, and um, I'm certainly guilty of that at the beginning. I thought I needed specific things. Uh, but nowadays, I just use the same few plugins every day. And I'm just like, I just know them very well. So that's kind of what I use. Um, and on organization, if you're not aware, there's something called the universal category system, I think it is, UCS. Um, if you need a starting point, maybe check that out. Um, and the, the, the idea of it is basically having categories for, for, for sounds, right? So if you are recording rocks, trees, like, you know, wind, just maybe start having, um, start organizing stuff that way. Just have a folder with rock sounds, folder with wind sounds. Check out the UCS thing. It has a list of all the different categories. And um, organization is something that changes throughout your career. I started one way, and now I'm doing that way, and whatever works for you. Yeah, on the topic of organization, I can also tell you my approach. Pure chaos. No, but um, yeah, the UCS system, um, Greg uh, already has put the link in there. That's nice. Thank you. Um, that's something I all... 
um, try to like now get my old recordings into so it's all in the format and I can find them more. But I haven't dived into anything like Soundvistors or uh, Soundminer yet because um, for me, in my workflow right now, I usually record about 90% or maybe even more of the sounds per project. So I put them in my project folder file and if I have something like very unique, uh, for example, like the cave recording, I usually use this for this one project only. Um, there are exceptions to that rule and something that I can not easily rec uh, recreate. I will put in like a general folder, but I otherwise I, I really lose, use like the stuff for a project. And if I move on to the next, I record it anew if I like need some more impact sounds because I might have another recorder now, I might have another microphone and I'm certainly going to do it in another place or with another, with another stuff. So, so it sounds um, unique again. And um, yeah, we have another questions. So maybe, I don't know, Aaron, if you have, anything on that um there is a question from i see a question from Kat. Uh, <laughs> yeah okay let's just I, i'm trying to keep um, track of them so the first one oh, i saw was sure. any tips on operating a big recording with multiple recording devices and crew members do you have any experience with that would that be a if it's a big recording like with multiple people and multiple recorders and, and what's the most important thing there I, I would say like syncing, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't run into this, but I think you can, just like with film, you, you'd be able to get a time code and have everyone synced up to that time code. So all your recordings are coming from the same, like they all have the same start point. If you don't have access to something like that, because I, I think they're pretty expensive, um, maybe just use a clapperboard, something like that. Just You need some kind of sync point. So use a clapperboard have three different recorders, everyone presses record, doesn't really matter when you press it, as long as you can sync it up to the clap, everything should work. Absolutely. I'm gonna take the next one, this one was from Max. Um, is it worth investing in a binaural microphone, for example, the Roland CS10 EM for field recording and how often would you use binaural recordings in your project's workflow? I can answer that because I have those microphones and um, I was really pleased with them. Um, for example, I used this for uh, the introduction for my podcast because I was thinking about most of the time people probably will be listening with headphones to a podcast. So this is a great use. I've used them sparingly, but I, I really, really like them. Um, but yeah, you're, you're probably aware that it doesn't really work with stereo speakers. It does sound a bit, yeah, it's, it doesn't sound as great as having a great stereo rig. So if you have a use for an app a game or whatever where you are pretty sure that most of the people will listen with headphones, then I'd say it's it's a worthwhile investment. Um, otherwise, maybe also for having fun because fortunately they are not that expensive. I think I think around eighty bucks. I mean it's it's still money, but yeah, um, I think. But you you really have to have a use for them. Um, there are some games that like blend in right at the start. Please use headphones. So if you're working on such a project, they could come in handy. But yeah, depends on. Depends on that. The next thing I, I saw was from Euro. Um, I'm sure I'm butchering all your names, so please excuse me and uh, send me death threats in the DM later. Um, what to edit exactly? Like if you record an ambience, do you edit the whole thing so that it doesn't have parasite sounds? Do you want to jump in, Aaron? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, so as a general rule of thumb, when you're, when you're editing your recordings, you want to edit them in a way that you might be able to use them for as many things as possible. Right. So when it comes to ambiences, um, I think you don't want to do anything too extreme. Um, but you there's certain things that you definitely want to get rid of. So say, for example, you bump into the microphone. There's um, you have a jacket on and there's like the cloth rustle from it. Or uh, maybe you're recording what should be a very quiet ambience and a bus goes by at some point in that 10 minute recording. That's the kind of thing you, got, you want to get rid of unless you want a recording with cars. Um, and then, for example, recently I was trying to get recordings that had no life in them. This is for a crowdsource. And this proved to be absolutely insane. Um, in order for them to sound lifeless, I had to get rid of absolutely every uh, source that was life, right? So this is birds, this is people and stuff. And it, it was... Uh, it was hard, but you might be in a situation where maybe you're working on a game that doesn't actually have people in it. It's like a post-apocalypse or something like that, and you you want to um, strip out all of those type of sounds. If that's what you're going for, 
do that in the edit and it will save you some time later on. Got a lot of questions coming in. Damn. Okay, so we have also something from Cat. Um, how do you avoid over-processing your recordings in RX? You want to jump on that as well? Yeah, I, I got that. That's fine. Awesome. Um, all right, so generally what I tend to do is um, the more you use RX, the more you're going to realize that after a certain point, you, you're butchering your recordings, right? So this is just something that you'll start to hear. Yeah. It usually uh, muffles the sound um, if you push things too far. And you never really want to push things too far, right? So my advice would be start playing around with the recordings and then find a sweet spot where you, you, you might try like the value of six or something. And you, you realize, okay, I've gone too far. Then just revert, go down to four, revert, go down to whatever you need to, two. And then once you actually start hearing the difference in the file and, and you, you start hearing that you're getting rid of the thing that you want to get rid of, that's going to be the sweet spot. And then maybe for safety, dial it back just a little bit less, you know, because maybe on someone else's kit, it might, it might play back different to yours. So the advice is kind of always go to the sweet spot and then back off a little bit. Yeah. So we have another one from Nathan. Um, what's a good way to add UCS categories to your recordings? Um, I could just say for myself, um, for now, I'm doing it like manually by hand. Um, after I recorded stuff, I go home, um, go through the material and name stuff I want to use. Um, but yeah, as I said, I'm looking into software hopefully sometime in the future. But for now, <laughs> I'll do it manually. Um, how about you, Aaron? Do you use any tools for that? Or? Yeah, um, I'm a big fan of SoundMiner, obviously. Um, as soon as I started looking into turning cloth labs into fireballs in this very elaborate process, um, I'm wanting to actually organize my library and take things to the next level. Um, I stopped using Soundly and moved to SoundMiner. SoundMiner was absolutely fine, but this was just something that I you know, wanted to play around with. I wanted a radium at the time, which is the sampler that comes with it. Um, and within Soundminer, you can actually organize everything. It, it has these specific tools that you can, you know, tell it to write the specific um, categories for you. But if I didn't have that, like you don't really need any of that to begin with. You can use um, the, what is it, the media, the media browser in Reaper or any other tool and just uh, get into the habit of renaming your files, like as Ben is doing. Just pull up the UCS list. Look at the category. Everything kind of has a format. So it's usually category underscore your file name underscore, you know, your name, whatever you're going for, that kind of thing. So just get into the habit of doing that. Um, stuff gets really interesting once you can add metadata, though. So maybe look into um, a way of doing that. I think Soundly lets you do that. And I think maybe the Pro Sound Effects one that is also on the cheaper side lets you do that. Um, metadata will be you putting in like the keywords for what you're looking for. So if your file, if your file Blank. is called Fireball, you know, yeah. you might, you write metadata in that file that will say it will contain words like, you know, fire, flames, burning, all of these other keywords that will make the file come like appear in your browser instead of just Fireball. Like it's going to be a little bit limiting. Yeah. So the next question, I hope I get everything. If I miss something, feel free to like ask him again, or like just write us afterwards. We are like just add a comment under this under this event. Uh, it's from Fernando. Is uh, thirty-two bit recording usually used in game audio, or is it still in twenty-four bit? I can't just speak for myself. I haven't used thirty-two uh, bit yet. I want to go into that, but for me, um, I want to use it. Um, especially also like with ultrasonic microphones or stuff to like really expand the possibilities of pitching stuff up, down and, and making stuff like really messing with stuff and making it, breaking it. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Aaron? Any experience there? Yeah. So I picked up a, um, a Mixpre, Sound Devices Mixpre 6, I think it was, um, about a year ago. That records 32-bit. I'd say the main advantage you have with 32-bit is um, the, the, the amount of gain you can get out of this thing. So you can basically record any type of sound, regardless of how loud or how quiet it is. And you're going to be able to make it work once you convert it in your door, right? So the workflow is usually take those 32-bit 30, uh, files, like fix the gain, and then convert them to 24. So 
when it comes to advantages for game audio, I can't like, I mean, maybe I, I, I haven't run into it, but I don't think there really is any inherent advantages within an engine or anything. But when it comes to recording, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, if you're like Greg, for example, and you record without headphones, it would be a godsend. Um, I've really, really, really enjoyed my time with a 32-bit recorder because it, it's like that extra thing that I don't really need to worry about. I can focus more on just pointing my microphones and looking for those textures and really being in the moment instead of having to worry about the, the technicality of maybe I clip this really loud sound and re that, that goes into a really soft one. Great. Yeah, the next question I saw was from Sarah. Um, how do you keep track of everything you're recording, as in do you make notes and take pictures of locations, etc.? Any tips for organizing in the sense? So I'm going to jump in there. Um, as I already said, I, I like to, either on the same day or if it was a long recording day on the next day, go through the stuff and organizing that, making notes or, or renaming them. But um, I used to make some photos, but then I also got a friend of mine involved to shoot some video. And I'm going to do some shameless self-promotion here and just going to post the video. But just as maybe an idea, if you have a project that's a bit bigger, maybe at least make some videos uh, on the locations we record if they are visually interesting for marketing purposes. Because um, that's something like behind the scenes that puts you like in the spot. People like see you working. And then you can mix the sounds under. That's what I did in this video. I had like the camera sound and then what the microphone hears and then how it sounds in, in, in game. And it's really, really cool to show um, the yeah game audio people are happy. Uh, the, the game pe developer people are happy about that using it for marketing. So, but to, yeah, to yeah make like notes or something, I don't. I used to try in the beginning to like note interesting locations for, ah, now I, if I need this, I go there. If I need this, I go there. That's the only thing I do because now, for example, I have in my Google Maps some places where I, where I know there's like this really nice waterfall and there's no sound around. So if I have some new microphone or some new f use for it, I, I'll visit that place again. But that's like the only thing I do because I always try to, I don't know, I feel like I always want to do something new or at least something different. And sometimes I just drive out there uh, on a whim and just look around and looking for, for new areas to, to make something new and unique. Mm -hmm. Aaron, not the Richards Aaron, but the other Aaron. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, when, yeah, when it comes to organizing, like the, the actual session, I feel like it, it depends on, on, yeah, just like the mood you're in really, uh, like the kind of the, the workflow you set up for that day. Right. So uh, a lot of the, last recordings that I've done was uh, me forfeiting all type of tripods and just I wanted like speed basically. So I had my my, my recorder on a bag and just like um, one microphone went around just pointing it around getting a ton of recordings. Um, and my workflow would be I'd get all the recordings go home start listening to them and start renaming them all. I usually um, my advice would be to slate your recordings. So before you actually do anything, just point the mic at your mouth and say, you know, I'm recording some rock impacts. Um, that way you're not going to, otherwise you're going to run into these situations where you're listening to a recording and you're like, what is this? You know, it's, it, you're not going to know. So slate it at the beginning, slate it at the end, you know, maybe you just pulled the recorder out and start recording. Don't worry about it. Get the recording and then right at the end say, this is what it is. Um, and then just make a note as you rename. If you want to be even more organized, maybe take a piece of paper along with you or like your smartphone is fine. And as you record, just take note of what it is. Take what like your recorder will show you. It'll be like recording one and just write down, you know, recording one is, is a waterfall. Um, and some other recorders actually let you type in the name. So like a mix free will let you do that. Whatever works for you, you know, depending on how fast you want to be, just go for that. <laughs> Yeah, I really want that recorder that lets me like edit on spot because going through all your material afterwards, it's just like with photo photography. It's it's nice going out and shooting hundreds of photos, but mm -hmm. then sifting through stuff can be can be annoying. I do feel like it's necessary though because it is it is because you're also listening again with another ear. Yeah, you know, what tends to happen to me and and this is something Ben and I have chatted about. Um, I record with uh, noise canceling headphones um, because it allows me to really isolate. On the, in, in the scene, it might be very windy, there might be traffic, whatever. So I'm compromising the actual sound of 
like how it really sounds um, for being able to actually hear it. So then I like to go back home with all my recordings and then it's kind of like, okay, let's see how this sounds on my, my pair of headphones and my speakers that I'm actually used to. And that's when I'm really, you know, getting a, a feel for what I've actually got on the day. Yeah. Um, the next question I've saw, seen is from Aditya. Aditya. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Um, I don't have an ide uh, ideal environment in my house or studio, but I have a Zoom H8 recorder. How much gain while recording Foley would you suggest I should have on the recorder considering targeting preamp noise? Do you want to? Um, yeah. Depends. I, I mean, yeah, it really depends. So well, I'd say for the majority of my career, I've had to record Foley in my bedroom or like something that is like an unsuitable room. And yeah, there's unfortunately, there's no such thing as the perfect game. It is all about where you're placing the mic, what you're really after. If you are after, say, like a gravel footstep, you might not want to stick the microphone right in the gravel and, 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 and get this really aggressive sound because then once you put it into picture, it probably won't be that aggressive. So if anything, if you're in an unsuitable recording space, I'd probably worry more about trying to contain things like early reflections uh, more than the actual gain itself. Like I think that would be a uh, general... Uh, general advice. I, I used to record with these these big blankets that I had for my bed, and I, they were like these big bear blanket type things, uh, fairy like furry blankets. And I'd um, put them up on my on my on my cupboards. I remember I had to record inside of a cupboard. I kind of like opened the doors and put all this stuff around it, and kind of put yeah. all these microphones in. And it was horrible. Like I had to um, run out of like go to my computer, press record run to the other side of the room, get into this cupboard, do my Foley, like go back out. So those are the kind of things that you have to work with if you're in an unsuitable room. Yep. Um, but I'd worry, yeah, I'd worry about that more, like trying to contain the actual sound more than finding a perfect game. That's a good answer, man. Um, I'm going to leave it at that because it's perfect. Um, the next one I saw was uh, from Dylan. Uh, when you get a project, say a video game cinematic promo or something similar and uh, or short with a lot of Foley required, how do you break down the scope of work? Do you have a list of assets you need to record or what's the best prep workflow? Thanks. Um, I can just say my workflow real quick because I had a, like a, a funny comic cutscene um, done recently, which was a lot of fun. And how I approached it was first, like go through it and note everything I could find, like every obvious, uh, obvious thing. And then I used very, very quick stand-in sounds. So I just went through my like general library and just put in general sounds for everything I could think of. And then on the second or third watch, I found stuff that I've missed because I, I've been used to those sounds now. And now I see, ah, there's one, one thing that doesn't have a sound yet. Uh, should there be a sound? That's also something to consider because not everything you see has to have a sound. But then also the other thing is there's something that's not seen that has a sound. For example, you have a scene in a house and there's, it's a sunny day outside and the window is open. Does that mean you hear birds outside or rain or whatever? Um, or is something in the other room that's happening there to create some kind of emotion that there's like rummaging around or people are shouting because it's an aggressive scene? Um, so doing that and my approach so far for all those things was like the same, like just going through, adding as quickly as possible, like shitty sounds, doesn't matter, like shitty footstep, shitty whatever, just to have all these kinds of sounds. Some of those will probably stay in because they fit and others you will like go through and say, okay, now I need like 20 footsteps. Those sound horrible. I need other ones. I know what I have to do. And you write your tasks down then. Um, that, that is my workflow. Yeah. Back yep. to you. Just, yeah. Just to add to that. Um, so when it comes to cinematics, I'm used to having a spotting session before absolutely anything. So just so I'm aware of how, yeah, to scope the workflow. Um, first step would be, putting the video into your door and um, spawning the whole session. So it's like, you know, everyone's footsteps, uh, there's uh, some chair scrapes, you know, how many um, different types of cloth do we need? And what I usually do is I just put markers for absolutely everything. And then I'll make tracks for absolutely everything. So it'll be like a track for feet, a track for um, chairs, a track for uh, metal, like all the different, all the different props, everything laid out. And then that's going to kind of give me a, a gauge for 
um, how much I'm going to have to record. So the next one I saw was from Andrew. Uh, what length do you aim for when recording ambient on Walla tracks? You want to go first? Um, you probably have more uh, experience on ambient stuff than I do, but my general rule is just record as long as you can. Like, I like to... Um, recently, I've been going for, say, recordings in between 10 and 20 minutes, and I like to drop my recorder off somewhere. So um, I was recently recording a room that had all these shutters moving, like with, with the, this, this day that everything went wrong and I was recording wind. And I just kind of left my recorder in that room for 20 minutes at different times of the day, like Ben said. And um, and then you're going to do what, what we advised earlier, like you're going to listen back through those recordings. And usually the 20 minutes is not going to be good. Um, like there's going to be a certain time where maybe yeah, like a track that goes by or a motorbike or just something that you don't really want in the sound. So you're always going to edit them and they're going to be smaller. That's why you kind of want to aim for the longest recordings you can. But if you're out in the field and you get like a three minute recording of something, don't feel like you, you failed or you should really be there for 20 minutes. Like the scene you might be using that in might be 30 seconds long. So you did a good job. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I also would say it depends. Um, and that that's where, at least for me, like the prolonged listening and the, the like active listening comes into place. Because if I'm at a place, for example, with the Walla and I need just like generic crowd noises and I want that specific like reverb there or you have like a a small area where there's lots of big buildings that have this nice slap back. Um, you want that. And it sounds the same after 20 minutes. You can like just stop that. I would say go at least for 15 or 20 minutes because you will always, like I just said, have stuff in there you don't want to have and trying to clean up something for just like five minutes and having lots of stuff there where you're like, ah, I can use this section, ah, but not this section. And then I have to crossfade, trying to stitch it together. And then it gets like a Frankenstein kind of shitty recording. So um, I would say always a bit longer than you think. Um, and for, for other things where you're not really sure if you can like take the time really um, I've recorded in the, in the mind chef, for example, the first session I did um, mainly to get the ambience for the game, which I knew wouldn't have to be very long. But um, already someone asked in the chat if I did like um, IR recording for the reverb uh, impulse response recording. And uh, no, not yet, but I will go back there. So now I have an idea of how stuff sounds and I will certainly keep my stuff in there for longer because um, you might think it sounds all the same. It's just like droplets coming down and it, it does sound nice, but you're like after a minute or, th or so you think, yeah, okay, that's fine. And it's also fine for a game. But when you're in there setting up and listening, you realize that sometimes there comes this moment where the, the droplets play a rhythm, for example, or you have this big drop in between, or you have those, like really the details that you notice when you listen for longer, that, that is something that really interests me. So next time I will like put my microphones in there, drop them in, go outside, have something to eat or something and come back after an hour or so um, for each of the locations in there. So I will probably do some more than, than one sessions. So it depends. Um, and as Aaron said, it's, it's also fine if you got there, have like 20 minutes of material, um, especially for game audio, if you're using it for loops and you can use it like in FMOD or WISE to make some more dynamic adjustments to make it sound more material than it is, that's also fine as well. But if you need something for or want something to find out what happens there in one hour of time or something, then yeah, it's also cool to do that. Um, and the next thing is, um, I'm also going to jump on that and then you can also, if you want to, is could you recommend as a good mic model for building a stereo rig? I personally absolutely love the LUM audio microphones. I recently used um, micro Uzi once as a stereo pair and put them just in a cheap like uh, road uh, stereo bar. And the stereo bar fits right in my um, backpack. Also the LUM mics are very small. So I have to set up in like two minutes and I can just put them anywhere, and I find them very nice for for ambient recording, especially if this, if it's like something delicate like droplets, because that's what the the micro uzis are very great for. So that this I can recommend, recommend, but otherwise, really like what you have is fine. If you have your Zoom recorder and have the XY thing, I have recordings used that sound like amazing recordings because a little bit of cleanup, a little bit of processing, and pff, that's fine as well. Mm -hmm. Use something, Aaron? Uh, yeah, just to add to that, I mean, I use a pair of Rode NT5s, which are mm -hmm. relatively cheap, 
And that's all I've used as my stereo pad the whole time. So like all my personal stuff. So that's the trick. You don't need to buy anything crazy expensive. Um, yeah. And, and what Ben said. Yeah. And I feel like we're, we're running out of time. So I think we should either blast through all the last questions. Um, you know, try and answer as many as we can. Yeah, absolutely. Just quickly, um, you said, Hobik, that the alarms are always sold out. Yes, please subscribe to the mailing list because you will get an email when they will go on sale. So you, you will have a date to prepare. And if you like are there on the date and time, you will probably get one. I got my, my geophone that way. Um, it's really easy to get them if you get on the mailing list. Uh, at least for me, I can't speak for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, very quickly, Vincent, any tips for doing stealth recording? Ah, stealth recording. Mm. I'm not a fan of stealth recording, so I'm going to like glance a bit over that. I mean, technically, mm -hmm. like the binaural ones look just like headphones. You put them in, walk around, nobody notices really uh, if you don't use the wind things. But I'm, yeah, stealth recording implies that you either not want it there or maybe are not allowed to record there. So, um, could be, but I know, yeah. Um, and Motas has this question how to avoid being stared at and judged when you're in the field and recording sounds, say in a populated area and not in a fully isolated one. That's all in your head. <laughs> it's all in your head, yeah. It's all in your head. Who cares? You're, you're getting yeah. paid or to record sounds or you're just having fun, right? So, absolutely. And if people like, like maybe stare back or, or smile friendly, and at least one of them will come up to you and ask you what you're doing. Um, of course, that's shitty because you need to record stuff, but it's also mm -hmm. great if they're asking and they're really interested, like, ah, oh, I've never heard of people like going out. Um, yeah, also I be always careful, get asked. Though. Do not walk with some crazy microphones into a dangerous place. Because, yeah, you know, not in a back alley. It's, it's all in your head. Just go out there, have fun. I usually record with the dead cat on my on my windshield and, you know, I get a lot of stares. But hey, I'm, I'm out there having fun. And absolutely, you know, it is what it is. And uh, Reyna, do you mostly record in stereo? Are there some sounds that you prefer to record as point sources? Um, quickly from my side, I absolutely most of the time use uh, mono recordings, uh, especially shotgun mics, because I'm doing a lot of stuff, for example, for first person shooters where you need like impacts or something, and they will always be placed in the game engine. Um, and I use stereo recordings mainly for ambiences where, and this is very important, where you don't have stuff. Um, too many th things that are localized. So, for example, for if you have like a nice forest area and bird sounds, I like to record ambience, I have some birds in there, but also record one shots in um, mono for birds. Either you use a, re a library or something, or um, I got a parabolic mic to get like really those isolated bird sounds because if, yeah, unfortunately you, you need something like that to get those. But then mm -hmm. you can place those as well because remember people can turn around in video games and your stereo image is fucked then. So, um, yeah, for stuff like the cave, if droplets are coming around you, drops are very short. So while you're turning, uh, the player doesn't really notice. But if you have something like a tractor running in the background and you turn around and the source, yeah, turns around with you, that's not that great. So for game audio, lots of mono stuff. Mm -hmm. I feel, yeah, 90% of what I record is mono. I like it just running and gunning and stereos for very special recordings where I might do a triple mic setup. I'll have a, a mono in the middle and the XY behind it so I can later on beef them up. Um, I think we're down to one minute. So yep. I think like, I think we, I'm going to mention like, I'll probably post my Twitter in the chat. If anyone else has any type of uh, questions, just jump in there, feel free to send me a DM and yep. I'll try and answer them. I'm sure Ben will. Absolutely. I'm this, doing the same right now. <laughs> have the same uh, approach and yeah massive shout out to uh, to everyone that organized this to Lewis and Greg and um, thanks to everyone for showing up it's been awesome answering everyone's questions it's been a lot of fun yeah. uh, it's been great chatting with Ben again Absolutely, and man. Uh, really looking forward to a ton of other talks so it's going to be a really nice two weeks absolutely Anything thank you so much happen? also yeah thank you so much also for the Overwhelming, overwhelming response. Um, it seems like you all enjoyed that, and we enjoyed it as well. So, um, oh, I saw a very quick question. Lucas, what about MS recordings for game production? Yes, you can use that. Um, long answer, later maybe. <laughs> yeah, as, feel free to add me on Twitter or write me a DM here. I'm happy to go through that stuff in the next couple of days. Um, yeah, and uh, go out and record. Okay. Have a nice day or night or whatever time it is in your place. Mm -hmm. And Aaron, nice talking to you again as well. Yeah, always a pleasure. So, yeah, have a nice night as well.
Bye, all.